So welcome everybody to our uh, second lecture in our series uh, of lectures connected to our Voices of War Comparative Perspectives uh, project here at Ohio State, the course that we are teaching, a uh, project that is being run by Professors Bruno Caban, uh, Peter Mansour, Mark Grimsley, and myself under the auspices of the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities uh, project exploring the evolution of modern warfare and veterans' identities. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome here to uh, the Ohio State University, uh, to our to, to this side of the pond as well, uh, Dr. Rob Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson comes to us from Oxford University, where he is. A whole, has a whole slew of, of hats that he wears. He's the director of the Oxford Changing Character of War Center, a senior research fellow of Pembroke College, uh, an associate of the Department of Politics and International Relations, uh, all at Oxford. Um, Dr. Johnson also, in his spare time, acts as an advisor to various branches of uh, the, the British government, Ministry of Defense, the Modern <coughs> Commonwealth Office, <coughs> Uh, in particular, the Armed Forces and Security Services. So he's clearly the the, uh, uh, the one who has the ear of those in power. Um, he's also the author of so many fascinating books and, and such a long list of them that I had a terrible time uh, <laughs> crossing off ones to list. So I'm going to, I'm going to it's an edited list, but just a few of the, of the books that he has published uh, of course, The Afghan Way of War, which many of you have read, not all. Uh, the Great War, and the rest, all of you, the rest of you should. The Great War in the Middle East, the Iran-Iraq War, um, Pulverfass im Hindu Kush, which I'm only adding to the list because it allows me to show off my excellent German accent. <laughs> Oil, Islam, and Conflict in Central Asia since 1945. Spying for Empire, The Great Game in Central and South Asia. Uh, but most of all, I'm looking forward to the forthcoming T.E. Lawrence of Arabia on War, which is due in 2019. I'm sure you're looking forward to that uh, as well. <coughs> Countless articles on insurgency, internal security, justifications of violence, war and intervention, strategies of security, etc., etc., etc. But today, Dr. Johnson will be speaking to <coughs> us on the experience of war. Please join me in welcoming Rob Johnson. for that very warm uh, introduction. I barely recognise myself. <laughs> what I can say about that. Um, actually, it's really nice that you mentioned about uh, Lawrence, because um, uh, T. Lawrence of Arabia is someone I didn't really want to study at all. It's just someone who kept crossing my path all the way through my uh, career. Um, and I felt I had to sort of deal with him once and for all and exercise this, uh, this feature, this Leviathan in my life. Um, Lawrence of Arabia uh, is not something I'm going to talk about this evening, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, but he did um, bequeath to us quite an interesting way of thinking about what war is. Uh, and in Seven Pillars of Wisdom, his sort of wonderful book, um, he says that war is three things. It's uh, algebra, um, it's bionomics, and it's diathetics. Mm -hmm. Typically pompous Oxford educated <laughs> individual. <laughs> Um, the algebra of war, as I said, the, is the bit that we tend to focus on when we think about what war is. It's the numbers, it's the material, um, it's the sheer scale of it um, that matters there. But the binomics is the human dimension of war. It's the sort of the fact that no one can survive in a battle space without water, without food, um, sleep, rest. You know, war isn't a constant. 24 hours a day activity, it has lulls in it. And in fact, in insurgent or guerrilla wars, most of the time, nothing is going on. Um, you're more likely to die of boredom, frankly, than lots of enemy action. But the thing that characterizes war, the third element, is the bit that Lawrence thought that we were forgetting, the diathetics. That's a word he claims that he stole from um, Heraclitus or someone, I think, if I'm rightly. But in it, uh, what he re is referring to is the cognitive dimension of war, the state of mind. And the way that you might think about this is to say that, yes, material factors, the algebra, are important. The human element of war is important in terms of being sustained. But war is ultimately fought in the minds of men. 
And I think that's a really important um, starting point for us this evening, because uh, actually um, when uh, Professor Scout was talking about the experience of war or voices of war, it made me think, okay, well, we won't talk this afternoon or this evening about um, a narrative history of the wars in Afghanistan, because you can find those anywhere. It'd be much more valuable for us to think about that diathetical component. What is going on in the mind of people when they're fighting wars? And I'm going to particularly the fighting personnel rather than civilians, although that itself is an enormously important subject because in insurgency, as you know, most insurgents are actually just civilians. They are just people drawn from the civilian population. Um, the military myth that you can drive a wedge between the insurgents and the population is the very <coughs> myth. Um, it's part of the problem of understanding. But this is also, hopefully, something of a reminder, um, this talk, that cultural history, uh, the history of ideas, all matter to what otherwise might be called just military history. I heard some culture historians rather rudely saying that military history was no more than arrows on a map. Now, that seems slightly unfair, actually. It's much more than that. But I do think um, that we have to blend in these ideas of well, where does culture make a difference? Let me give you an example um, to get us started straight away. In the 1930s, and those of you who looked at the Afghan World War will know what's coming, but in the 1930s, the British wrote a manual about how to fight against the Afghans. And it, they, were, uh, they had troops that were stationed on the northwest frontier of India, um, and it was pretty likely there'd be some sort of conflict in the future against Afghans. So they came up with this kind of list. And they said, first of all, the Afghans appreciate justice. Um, uh, you should uh, try to show an open hand, but be firm with them, um, but be patient. And if you have to implement punishments, make them immediate. Don't try and bring in a criminal justice system, which they don't understand. Um, they want immediate justice. He said there are people of good humour, um, but they have got a disposition to, to be punished, and accept punishment, and then be friends again. Uh, this British manual went on to say that they're easily discouraged, the Afghans, by vigorous offensive action. Um, and yet they're possessed of guile and chicanery. You can spot what's happening here, is that there are a set of British cultural assumptions about how people in Central and South Asia thought or operated, which were being sucked into, without them really realising what they were saying, drawn into um, caricatures of how Afghans actually fight in war. Uh, and it went on with, you know, for me one of the most amusing is that um, Afghans, if they enjoyed a small tactical success, it had an enormous stimulating effect on them. Well, wouldn't that be true of any army, any soldiers uh, in any combat environment? Uh, I've been amongst soldiers where, you know, they scored one hit on one gunman, and the whole place lit up with excitement and enthusiasm and cheering, because there's such relief that this sniper who was going to kill us had now been killed. So it seems to me that would be true of all of us. Um, the British accused the Afghans of fanaticism. They would make sudden rushes to close quarters. Well, what is a close quarter battle if not a sudden rush to close with your enemy and destroy him face to face in hand to hand combat? So these cultural assumptions, I find them quite interesting. Um, uh, and they make a difference to how people think about their adversary. So when you're looking at the experience of war of any text that you're dealing with, any nationality, Remember that you're always looking through a lens which has been bequeathed to us by the author of that text. Okay? And then you have to ask yourself another question, of course, which is, why did this author feel it was necessary <coughs> to write this text? And why now? What, what was going on um, to make them feel that particular way? Now, what I like to do is, and those of you, let's say, who've seen the Afghan Way of War book will know that what I like to do is take these texts that we have, these recorded texts by the British, <coughs> and the Soviets later on, and then flip them over to see what the Afghan perspective was. Now, in many cases, we don't have the Afghan voice. Okay? So if you're doing a voice, a voice as a war subject, it's very hard when you're you know, looking at, say, Central African um, proto-states of the 19th century and say, well, how do we recover the, Afghan, the, the, uh, the African voice if we don't have the text? Well, you can do some very interesting historical reconstruction, as I would call it, with the English or French texts, or German texts, or Italian texts, or Portuguese texts that you may have. Now, the way you can do this is to, for example, if we took um, this one I just said that 
small tactical successes have an enormous stimulating effect. Or that Afghans, you know, fighters are very patient. They will watch your tactical drills until they're very familiar with you, and then they'll attack you um, to subvert those drills. What I'd say is that you could say from an Afghan point of view, we are looking for opportunities. Um, we have to be patient because we know that we are undergunned compared with our enemies. So we have to be patient and wait for the opportune moment, as they say in the Pirates of the Caribbean, and then go for it. Um, you have to defend uh, a position, but avoid annihilation. The British were saying whenever the flanks were turned by the <coughs> Afghan force, the Afghans would filter away and then appear to be civilians again. Well, that's to avoid annihilation. That's purely a practical response to the kind of threat that they faced. So let's move on. What I'm going to try and do is, uh, in the time I have left, is to give you a few sections that we can look at. So this is actually quite hard to see, but we've got some uh, American service personnel who are uh, under fire and are returning fire on a wall. Uh, this is in Kunar. Um, these four sections will um, essentially consist of looking briefly at the British in the 19th century, um, a few words about the Soviets, and then perhaps the final concluding um, critique of just a few moments uh, about you know, what's been happening more recently uh, about this experience of war. The central question is this. Um, to what extent is there a universal experience of war? To what extent is it common to everyone? And to what extent uh, is it distinct through perhaps some national or ethnic or social identity? Um, and I think with that we might then say, is it distinct because of some context? In this case, we're going to look at the context of Afghanistan through um, two major periods of history, um, two different centuries. But you could say, is the context, um, is it distinct because you're a frontline soldier, uh, because there are um, commanders with more responsibility? Do they feel very differently? Is their experience of war different? from that of ordinary soldiers, I can tell you it is. Um, is it different if you're a logistician or a medic, a pilot, uh, a crewman of a ship um, in, a, in a different kind of war? Um, and finally, I think we have to sort of decide whether there's something about the individual here. Obviously, everyone's individual experiences are different. Uh, and. Um, Everyone's in spot responses are coloured by your own background, your own perceptions. But when we look at groups uh, of fighters or soldiers or marines or airmen, whatever it is, we might divide up. Let's look at these different groups. Let's have a, a think about some of who these groups are and, and how they're taken. So if you took, for example, um, officers um, and volunteers in, in any force. When they go to war, clearly their motivation is going to be of a magnitude higher than a conscript. Their willingness to take risks, their attitude towards risk generally, is going to be much more robust, I would argue, than, say, a conscripted um, soldier. For the conscripted soldier, uh, the priority might simply be survival. Um, and they are more likely, in the historical texts, to recall penalties, much more likely to recall them um, and to report them than perhaps, say, a soldier, uh, an officer or a volunteer um, than would do. I think one wonder if there's also perhaps something that happens through time, a greater conformity to the social structure of a military force or the conditions of war um, as they go through, uh, say, the phases of the conflict or they've been there a lot longer as their experience builds. So one of the things you notice about inexperienced military personnel is they'll report on just about everything at the beginning, and then later in the conflict, what seems to be then very routine no longer appears very much in their writing. So the distortive effect you can have, if you're looking at, say, the First World War in 1918, um, and looking at what veterans talk about, they stop talking about the shelling quite a lot of the time. If it's not very, if it's not proximate, of course, if it's very proximate, they'll talk about it, but if it's same distance away, but for a new recruit in 1914, that would have been extraordinarily significant. Even distant gunfire was commented on. So all these things make a difference. I think um, the phases, that the, the life cycle of a soldier makes a difference too in the way that they write about the experience of war. So basic training um, will be uh, important uh, because that's not just about teaching skills. That's about a social transition to military life and its expectations. 
specialist training or elite training makes a difference too. Um, creating, of course, those in-groups and out-groups um, that uh, matter uh, in that age-old military issue of cohesion. A cohesive unit is more likely to take casualties and continue to function. Um, a, a very poorly cohesive unit, divided amongst itself, will probably fall apart more quickly, won't take very many casualties, and will collapse, run, uh, and there's examples of the Soviets doing that, for example. One of the things you also noticed is that um, these, uh, these forms of training make a difference to the outward form of a military unit or an individual. So uniforms, accoutrement, demeanour, or as the British call it, bearing, all make a difference. Um, as individuals start to try and fit the mask of what they think they should be as a soldier. And that makes a difference to memoir, of course. So when you're reading historical accounts, just be aware of that too. But their status will change, and as training and military experience and, and war experience develop, so there's a deepening of this process of either cohesion or uh, the views they have. And that final moment of transition to a war footing, there's a sort of ritualisation takes over. Things are taken far more seriously. People get quite realistic about the training. Um, and um, you get parades or orations appear to be quite important. And again, uh, some great examples you can find from the Soviet era in Afghanistan of Soviet officers realising their soldiers are becoming reluctant to fight, going in for the kind of Soviet, almost Roman-style oratory before they go into action, uh, and yet failing uh, once they get there. And then there's this uh, next period of time, which I think is very uh, important and not very well understood amongst scholars, which is what you might call the approach to battle. And if you want a vivid account of that, just read Clausewitz's book one again. And remember, he describes, in the opening of the book about the nature of war, he describes approaching a battlefield. And it's, if you read it with a degree of realism in your mind, it's pretty vivid stuff, actually. It's actually quite terrifying. Um, the fact that there are so many unfamiliar sites and locations, uh, that the climate is different, the altitude is different, the clothing of the population, the way that people smell, sounds, Expressions on people's faces which are unfamiliar, gaping mouth, teeth chattering, some people wet themselves, extraordinary sense of threat, a culture shock uh, of an extraordinary degree um, that people remark on. And then of course once they're actually in that imminent moment of uh, approach to battle, an awareness, a heightened awareness of, of imminent destruction, of casualties, of memorials uh, around them, and curiosities. Uh, the most striking thing for me, my first battle experience was having got past the place where I've been shooting from to the place where I've been shooting at. All the ground was ploughed as if someone had been along with an agricultural implement and I couldn't understand what on earth was going on. Then I realised it's my fault. I've been shooting too low and all the bullets have been furrowing the ground. So that was quite a weird sort of... And I remember standing there looking at the ground. I mean, like an absolute target, an absolute idiot thing to do. But um, luckily I'm still here. The enemy must have missed. Um, and then, of course, there's this moment of combat, too, which I think we should deal with. Um, it's uh, something which I think um, we like to write about. Thomas Hardy said that you know, battle makes rattling good history. But um, I don't think we understand it very well, actually. Uh, this is my charge against us as historians. Um, the first thing you notice about the battlefields of Afghanistan in the modern era is that they're all empty. Um, you don't see your enemy at all. Um, the volume of noise is far more significant than the volume of the enemy. Uh, it is very, uh, the detonations of, of explosives and of bullets and so on is, is very distracting. Do we not used to it? Um, and uh, the, the literally people talk about ear splitting crack when bullets go past your head. They're not joking. The air is actually being split by the high velocity of the bullet as it goes past your ear or just above your head. And it really hurts the noise uh, of it so loud. And what really matters at those moments is junior leadership. It's the bond of the small unit, the Shields and Janovitz sort of thesis, really. And I can testify to you as an individual who's been to war on a few occasions that that really does matter. That drilling, you know, the drilled, obedient, automated responses are, are fascinating and important. And then finally, the moments of close quarter battle, which would also characterise Afghanistan. Um, some very unusual things happen. People shriek or grunt. 
um, in ways that you might find slightly odd, uh, actually. It's very guttural. Um, there's a lot of exertion, um, but people don't seem to notice they're exerting themselves. Um, they're, they're filled with a lot of energy. Even people can be wounded and miss the point they've actually been hit in some cases and have to be pointed out to them that they've actually been shot by somebody uh, because their um, peripheral senses have shut down for what is only now the core activity. People talk about a time-lapse effect, you know, slow-mo kind of movie footage in their head. Um, often that's rationalisation after the event, by the way, but just to say it's there. Um, and then there's that sort of moment of the face-to-face -face killing, uh, which historians don't write about killing very much, um, surprisingly. But uh, the, the kill or kill, be, be killed, mainly. <coughs> and then the protestations of the wounded, um, or the enemy at the last moment, the last few yards, sort of trying to lay down their weapon or stop shooting and surrender. Normally they're too late by then, they get, they get killed anyway. Um, and then, of course, above all, the desire to <coughs> survive, um, to assert themselves. People get very relieved and euphoric when they actually kill the other guy before, um, if they're not killed themselves. And then immediately after the fighting, there's a strong sense of anticlimax. There should be, surely there should be a, a kind of show-stopping moment now that we've won. And actually in battles, what happens is that it just suddenly stops. Um, and it's all over, and, and there isn't an ending. That's the point. But there's a lot of um, exhaustion, um, nausea. Uh, some people still have their blood up. You can still see people walking around, um, still shouting, even though there's nothing to shout at. Uh, even though the shooting stopped, they're still really hyperventilating, um, and that's very odd to deal with, people trying to calm them down. And if you've ever been in a situation when you're really, really angry, and someone comes up to you and says, now calm down, what's the last thing you'll do? <laughs> right, you're with me, okay? So, um, very different strategies are needed, suddenly, from the intense combat experience to then the kind of post-combat experience. And then finally, things like, um, you know, having to reorganize, looking at prisoners, the wounded, um, ammunition needs, the possibility of enemy counterattacks. And when all that is over, and people come home, there's a strong sense of the importance of ritual, uh, of farewells, um, the sense of something being incomplete, uh, loss, and then the memories, the reliving fragments of that experience without actually making any real sense, because it's disconnected. It's like a jigsaw piece lifted out of a jigsaw. You're not quite sure why that uh, should fit there anymore. So I thought um, what we should do, uh, though, is you want to hear about Afghanistan, what about these theoretical notions? So we should just quickly <coughs> turn to that. And the experience of, um, let's take the British soldiers of the 19th century, uh, that the overall experience was a lot of marching, actually, um, over long, long distances, either in extreme temperatures of heat or cold, um, and occasional excitement of sniping, um, the theft of baggage animals, um, possibility occasionally of murder of civilian camp followers of a military column. But to be honest with you, um, not much different from marching about in parts of India, uh, which was under British occupation for 300 years or so. Um, except that there were moments, of course, where things were contested. And I think, you know, well, again, what we do, we tend to focus on the atypical, because grabs our attention, but I just want to put that image up of a, an army on campaign with, again, not a lot really going on. This might be slightly more useful, though, for us to think about, because um, this is an image, a painting in the National Army Museum in London of uh, the Gurkhas and Highlanders storming a ridge called Paiwar Quartal, and uh, you might be forgiven for thinking, what on earth is going on? Well, I think that would be fairly representative of both battles, mm -hmm. um, actually. Um, there's a lot of confusion. You can look at there's a slope, there's a, a ridge top, there's a lot of woodland, um, there's a lot of hand to hand fighting going on, fighting at very close quarters in the dark. And that's about right, really, uh, as a painting of military art goes, because um, at Paiwa Katal in uh, December 1879, an Afghan force was holding a ridge line. Um, it was assaulted by British and Indian troops, um, and uh, the uh, fighting was largely characterized by this. The, uh, what the artist doesn't represent uh, was the experience, though, um, of some of the British Indian troops about their own side in terms of the gunnery. So the Afghan artillery, uh, the artillery soldiers, had never fired live ammunition, even in training, when they were deployed with the guns. 
They had no idea they had to operate the weapon system that they were in charge of. British and Indian gunners, by uh, contrast, were regarded as the corps d'élite of the old Indian army. So their accuracy was brilliant. Uh, it, was, it was almost uncannily precise, such that they were able to land shells right on the top of Afghan artillery pieces, killing all the gunners and demoralizing Afghan uh, artillery fighters as a result. Uh, it almost went wrong, though. Um, a flanking maneuver by the commander, Lord Roberts, um, was discovered, in fact, betrayed by two Pashtun soldiers who were in an Indian Army regiment at the time. Uh, so a lot of British soldiers felt very angry about um, uh, Muslim soldiers uh, in the Indian Army from that moment. Um, but what really determined the outcome of the battle was not courage on either side, it was discipline and organisation. The British proved that they were able to remain cohesive and organised and manoeuvre their way around the flanks of an Afghan force. So the artist has chosen to demarcate the final moment, the final approach. Close quarter battle is the most exciting, but actually the battle was already won by manoeuvre before it even got this far. I did a, another occasion, just a, a week or so after this, at the Battle of Chiresia, also in 1879. Um, the Afghan uh, soldiers were shooting the British, and the British military accounts of the period, they, they're very anodyne, they're about manoeuvres. But the officers describe the bullets, uh, the rounds, we would say in military speak, going over their heads like buzzing bees. Now, that made me think, that's interesting. Now, why were the Afghans firing overhead? Well, if you've met anyone who knows about recruit training, soldierly recruits will pull a trigger, and it pulls the rifle up. Okay? And the Afghan soldiers, to make their weapons easier to carry, because these long rifles they had, they would cut them off like sawn off shotguns. So their weapon systems were reduced in range, and they tend to fire too high. So the British soldiers were passing underneath this hail of gunfire and getting very, very few casualties indeed. Now, what conclusion would you make about your enemy? If you went through that experience, you'd say they're pretty poor soldiers, they're inaccurate, they're inadequate, they're inexperienced, they're just Afghans. And that whole attitude of they're not very good because they're Afghans becomes self-reinforcing. What I mean to say to you about this in terms of military history, if you're doing a wider subject than just Afghanistan, is don't be fooled into thinking that the Western forces of the 19th century have technological superiority, that's why they win. No. It's how you use the weapon system that's the most important, not the technology that you possess. <clears throat> so let's move on a pace, because we're uh, running through time very quickly, and I've really only just got into my stride. But simply to say that um, experiences um, in that uh, 19th century period um, obviously are transformed by the time we get to the 20th century, because um, the third Anglo-Afghan War of 1919 which commenced with Afghan aggression, if you remember, against the British on the northwest frontier province. Um, the British do have a technological edge in terms of air supremacy, uh, and as you can see, these little armored cars at the bottom. It's air supremacy that makes a difference. The Afghans were completely unable to protect themselves from air attack, and they were so demoralized and confused by these attacks that many of the Afghan fighters started to turn against their own government. Um, and there are British accounts of the Afghans fighting amongst themselves because they're so um, demoralised by it. Different situation on the ground. Very inexperienced Indian troops were um, routed by handfuls of Afghan fighters who fought up in the hills. Um, such as nicknamed in one occasion Derby Day, the, the rout was so complete, about two kilometres, the Indian soldiers just threw down their weapons and ran away uh, because they didn't really want to be there and they were afraid of the reputation that Afghans had. But, again, just to sum up this phase though. Um, <coughs> that of, yes, universal experiences, what I described to you at the beginning in terms of you know, what every soldier goes through from training to the approach to battle and battle is replicated in many ways in the British experience of Afghanistan. Um, and, uh, and yet, um, I think there are still some very important cultural historical distinctions that we should make about this. And the 19th century values about what your adversary was ethnically or in terms of their experience tended to pervade a lot of what was then written in the 1930s about the Afghans. And all of that has come through to the present day. So you hear um, wildly exaggerated expressions like Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. Well, if you're a Mughal, a Persian, a Mongol, an Arab, a British uh, imperial official, and you heard that statement, you would laugh. 
because it's simply untrue. Though all those uh, empires occupied Afghanistan for periods between 70 and 100 or 300 years, uh, the only empire to have been defeated ultimately by Afghanistan was the Soviet one, to which we now very quickly turn. Um, so I'll move past that um, and simply remind you that um, here we are. What was the military experience of most Soviet soldiers in Afghanistan? Um, periodic terror, mines, for example, uh, ambushes, many complex ambushes, um, with, uh, I, I think, a number of rarer military successes of their own. Um, the destruction of villages, for example, or um, communist reprisals born of frustration for not being able to get to grips with the dookies, the ghosts, uh, of, a, um, of that sort of that war, that period. Um, Afghanistan's communication systems uh, were very, very poor. Um, and uh, the, um, again, the other successes I think the Soviets could, could refer to in that war against the uh, so-called Mujahideen was that the Mujahideen were very bad at operational security on their radio communications. And so if they use radios, it's very easy for the Soviets to intercept them and to anticipate what's going to happen. But most of the time, for Soviet soldiers, um, the war is going on somewhere else, which is an expression you often hear in insurgencies, actually, in other campaigns. The war is going on somewhere else. Distant battles fought by others. The most significant battle fought by the Mujahideen before 1989, before the famous Battle of Jalalabad, was actually between Tajik Afghans and Gilzai Afghans, Mujahideen groups fighting other Mujahideen groups. That's the most significant battle. There are a couple of events that people refer to, like um, the, the fighting around the Pakistan border area, um, the fighting around the Salang Tunnel, but frankly, they're only skirmishes. What is different about this era, um, the Soviet war, I would say the British war was in Afghanistan, was that there were no big battles like Mawa Qatar or Chalaisiyab or Maiwan. The experience of Soviet soldiers most of the time is boredom. Dirty water, poor sanitation, uh, their cooks were awful, their diet was abysmal. Um, they lived in dust and mud all the time, experiencing heat and cold at extreme levels. Um, and they used physical training to fill their time on base cheeses, not unlike the United States Army in Afghanistan today. In the bases, uh, what characterized your routine was the constant to and throwing of helicopter traffic, uh, but hospitals taking in wounded, often by helicopter. Um, there was a very bizarre difference that the Soviet era than for many of them today, which is they had a rendering factory in uh, Kabul, in the military base there, where they take all the body parts and um, try to sort of deal with them, because there were so many body parts from Soviet soldiers to deal with. But most people lived in a tent city in different bases, 60 uh, men to a tent, um, and uh, they made their own homebrew, uh, they acquired drugs, they harbored letters from home, and they improvise with their comforts, just like soldiers have done over the generations. Universal experiences, if you like. And then the routine. The routine of vehicle patrols, air patrols, helicopter patrols, foot patrols, and those foot soldiers carrying, as soldiers often do in on campaign, from the Roman Empire onwards, heavy loads of water, ammunition, and in this modern period, radio batteries, rations, helmets, weapons, grenades, all the other paraphernalia of war. What was some... Um, uh, has been remembered, of course, is the ambushes, uh, which can induce panic and shock. Um, and the fact that wounded or dead personnel who got left behind temporarily and were recovered later were invariably mutilated. And that's not because Afghans are intrinsically barbaric or evil, it's because it's a deliberate technique of terror, designed to demoralize their enemy. Uh, one Special Forces Brigade um, company in April 1985 um, of the entire company, there was only one survivor, and he'd gone out of his mind. The Afghan Mujahideen decided to leave one man alive, because that way it would frighten all the other special forces in the Soviet armed forces. Um, everyone else was either beheaded or disabled uh, on the battlefield. And as a result, there were routine killings by Soviet soldiers. Um, there were 5,200 Soviet personnel uh, in prison for military crimes against Afghans. But that was only a small proportion of the actual numbers who were guilty of excessive violence against civilians. And casual killing became casual uh, in the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Um, motorized armored vehicles were driven alongside, along roads, and they would just pump fire into villages as they drove along, just 
for the hell of it. Um, there was routine torture, for example, and not just at a full of Charky prison, so famously, but all over the country. And at the same time, lots of other acts of indiscipline, um, of selling of equipment and stores, um, a rise of, as a result, of pointlessness as the sort of attitude of the Soviet soldier, disillusionment of the dishonorable conduct, um, anger that this war seemed to be for no purpose at all, and that the dishonorable conduct, uh, conduct was, everything that, um, was something that everyone acquiesced in uh, rather than actually opposing. And when public anger in the Soviet Union began to rise, as, as people got fed up with the um, official argument that there was a, an internationalist duty to go to Afghanistan and assist against reactionary and American forces who were there, um, when the public in the Soviet Union realized what was going on, uh, and just how many zinkies, how many bodies were coming back in zinc lined coffee, and zinky, um, there was real alienation. But not just the alienation of the public from their own government, but alienation of the veterans from their own people, which had an enormous impact on the way that um, people viewed the war. Now, I'm pretty much running out of time, so there are lots of things we could talk about in terms of you know, how that war went and how it was um, <coughs> approached by the Soviets. Um, but I think what we would say is that, again, a lot of the universal features would be prominent. Um, the fact that um, the climate was so unforgiving, that the landscape was so mountainous and, and unforgiving, that they had to bring in so many of their own logistics which made them vulnerable to ambushes and attack. That um, Soviet soldiers were surprised that the weapon systems that they possessed, that they thought were so important, so powerful that they could have faced down any NATO force in Europe were designed for open terrain uh, or the steppes. They were not designed from the mountainous country. Uh, but the training they received was only for conventional warfare. So when they got attacked and ambushed and they had to respond, once the ambushes had left, the only other thing to do was to assault a nearby village in the way that you would do in a conventional battle by overwhelming fire followed by an infantry assault protected by armoured vehicles. The result was the only people they really killed were mostly civilians. In their isolated posts, um, they were very bored, of course, as I say. Uh, they, um, some of the Soviet soldiers used to just sell rations and, and fuel. They would cook, boil their ammunition in buckets, and then sell the ammunition as well, in the hope that the boiling <coughs> process would somehow affect the performance of, of the ammunition they were selling. <coughs> the, Afghans did what they always did, they'd watch very carefully what the Soviets were doing, they'd work out their tactical training drills, and then try to work out ways of attacking them. But there was a huge amount of collusion between the Afghan uh, National Army, um, oops, sorry, uh, the Afghan National Army and the, um, the Mujahideen, the, the so-called insurgents, uh, to the extent that even the head of the Afghan Army Intelligence Service was cooperating with one of the leading Mujahideen commanders, Ahmad Shah Massoud. In 1986, there was a brief attempt to win the war. Um, uh, the edict came down from the Politburo that the war must be won in 12 months. But between 1987 and 1989, it was a long process of withdrawal. Um, they left successfully, the Soviets. They left behind a regime that was functional until it ran out of money, caused by the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. But the other legacy that was bequeathed was the incidence of militias. Most Afghans who fought on the communist side did not fight in the regular army, but in militias that were given regular army designations. And when the war came to an end, there was therefore a ready-made force to take on the Mujahideen. And the civil war of the 1990s was a direct result uh, of that uh, militia um, establishment. The largest militia, by the way, don't think of these as you know, guys that exercise with you know, kind of muskets in, down in Virginia, right? This is not that kind of militia. The, the George Johnny militia was 23,000 strong, had its own airlift capability, artillery, and armor. Okay, this is a, a military army uh, commanded by none other than Abdul Rashid Dostu. So, let's finish up with where we are right now. Um, I think it'd be true to say that even for the most recent conflict in Afghanistan, a lot of universal experiences of war are still there including the empty battlefield, um, the, uh, the, the kind of different phases one goes through to get to, to war itself. Um, <coughs> errors, of course, on, on both sides. 
uh, throughout the conflict, that's normal in war. We don't think that you know, we should really just criticize Western forces for getting things wrong. Everyone gets things wrong in war. The side that wins is the one that just makes the least mistakes, in my experience. Um, but I think what is um, interesting, uh, and I would just like to mention in terms of the experience of war about our own service person, I say that for someone with American family as well as UK family, is um, the media interest in this conflict is only in the exceptional. And we've got to be very careful as historians that we don't overlook the routine. And I would ask you just to merely consider this as a, as a thought about uh, US forces and their experiences of war in Afghanistan. The routine courage getting up day after day to face a daily threat is much more demanding than the so-called inspirational courage that comes when you're in a moment of crisis. Okay? If there's a car accident and you rush to the scene and you deal with it courageously, you're a good person. Imagine to have to run into the middle of a busy highway to deal with a car accident every day, month after month, maybe sometimes year after year. So post-campaign experiences that we are dealing with, many of our veterans are different now, we've still got obviously 10,000 US troops in Afghanistan today, but the post-campaign experiences that we are interested in, that resonate with us because of our interest in history, um, is, is fascinating because they're going through what we would expect right now. A sense of anti-climax, as one veteran put it to me, one minute you're there, next minute you're not. Okay, it's that simple. Okay, a, a life-forming experience, one minute, followed by nothing, literally nothing. It's very hard to deal with that. Okay, um, the fact that their experiences are, also, are respected amongst their own peer group, soldier to soldier, marine to marine, airman to airman, you know, and those navy people too. Um, but public indifference caused by these stories going out of the headlines. And I think what happens is that gaps between citizens and veterans increase very, very quickly once things fade away from national memory. Particularly when, as I saw with your lovely photographs of visits to the Normandy beaches, we memorialize certain conflicts, but we then tend to forget other ones altogether. And then we wonder why they find it tricky, these veterans. So the thing that's going to moment, the thing to look for, the historical artifact the text of the next generation is not going to be found only, by the way, in visual imagery or in written words. It's also going to be in video culture. Soldiers self-memorialise at the moment by making videos of themselves set to high-octane music with pictures of technography and fire and people and postures. Um, I don't think it's still known as cool in the US to posture in a particular way, but in Britain it's known as being a bit alley. And where that word comes from, I have no idea. <coughs> but the public memorials and parades are all there for the dignity of the veterans uh, and memorialization. But I think we need to be mindful that historic history is being created right at this very moment, and it's up to us as historians to begin to mine that material uh, as soon as we can. Thank you.